Good afternoon. I'm Ed Remus, the Social Sciences Librarian at Northeastern Illinois University. On behalf of the NEIU Libraries, I'd like to welcome you all to this discussion. Today's event is made possible thanks to funding awarded by the American Rescue Plan Humanities Grants for Libraries. This is an initiative of the American Library Association made possible with funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities through the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. Today's event is also made possible thanks to the planning efforts of our moderator, Kristalyn Ortiz. Kristalyn is a master's student of history at Northeastern Illinois University, and she is also the founder and president of the NEIU History Club. Thank you, Kristalyn, for bringing us together today. Oh, and Kristalyn, it looks like you have to unmute. Okay, hi. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Um, so the topic for this event was motivated by recent controversies related to free speech. Some of these controversies have arisen out of society. On social media, the words and ideas that people express have become more public and less private than ever before. And some of these words and ideas can be deeply offensive and even hateful in nature. Meanwhile, a cancel culture has arisen across numerous social institutions and this has affected celebrities, TV shows, and political figures. A former US president has even been banned from Twitter. These issues have reinscribed some longstanding lines of debate about free speech. The First Amendment to the US Constitution states that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. For centuries, free speech advocates have argued that a free and prosperous society depends upon the right of each individual to express themselves without fear of government censorship. Those in favor of limitations on speech rights have countered that governments should have the legal authority to censor speech that is deemed offensive or socially harmful. Political progressives have taken this latter approach during recent decades to argue in favor of hate speech laws in the United States, though some deem these laws to be unconstitutional. The prospect of combating hate and harm has likewise motivated social media corporations to censor and regulate speech in online environments. In an era when uninhibited expression seems to be causing offense and harm, is free speech still something of value to society or would society benefit from greater boundaries on speech? Who should be responsible for drawing and enforcing these boundaries? And what implications do such boundaries have for politics, including the speech rights of political dissidents? Joining us to discuss these questions are four scholars with distinct perspectives on issues related to free speech. Catherine Cross is a widely published author and PhD student at the University of Washington Information School who studies antisocial behavior online. Jamal Green is a professor of law at Columbia Law School, whose most recent book is How Rights Went Wrong, Why Our Obsession with Rights is Tearing America Apart. Eric Heinz is a professor of law and humanities at Queen Mary University of London, where, whose most recent book is The Most Human Right, Why Free Speech is Everything. Nadine Strassen is Professor of Law Emerita at New York Law School and the former president of the American Civil Liberties Union. Her most recent book is Hate, Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech, Not Censorship. I've asked each of our panelists to give opening remarks for about 12 minutes each. After this, each panelist will take a few minutes to respond to any points raised by their fellow panelists. I've also encouraged them to pose questions to each other and to engage each other in dialogue during the response round. Then for the remainder of the event, Ed Remus will moderate questions from the audience one at a time. We wanna end the event no later than 4 p.m. So I'll ask our panelists to give brief closing remarks by 3.45 at the latest. Now we'll hear from our first speaker, Catherine Cross. Catherine Alejandra Cross is a PhD candidate in information science at the University of Washington's School of Information, where she studies the causes and dynamics of online abuse and how platform affordances shape social interaction online. Catherine is a widely sought after critic who has written extensively about online culture, social media, and video gaming. For the last decade, Catherine has written about and researched the way social media impacts free expression and has intervened in many debates about online speech, content moderation, and their relationships to acts of regression in the physical world. Thank you for being with us here today, Catherine. Thank you so much for having me. And I may say that it is an enormous pleasure and privilege to be on this panel with such august personages, with uh, such fascinating ideas about free expression. And thank you for sharing the space with me. 
There is no way to understand free speech in 2022 without recognizing that we are in a moment of crisis for democracy itself. To that end, while I am theoretically on team restriction today, let me begin by emphasizing what this talk is not. I will not make a case for extensive government restrictions on free expression, nor will I call here for German-style hate speech laws to be brought to the US. Germany's own experience with the depredations of Alternativ for Deutschland make abundantly clear the limits of such an approach, particularly with fascists who will quickly learn to express the same destructive ideas with different words. Indeed, fascists will always flout the spirit of such laws. I also stand, or in this case sit, before you as a chastened cyber feminist, where once I agreed with fellow scholars like Danielle Keats Citron that the Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act of 1996 needed to be reformed to protect victims of online harassment, I, know no, I now no longer believe that this is possible or desirable. And it's this last point that I'd like to speak more on today because it leaves us open into what I think is the biggest problem we face, the very terms of such debates. Section 230 is in so many ways at the heart of the American free speech debate. You may be familiar with it as the originator of the debate about whether social media websites are publishers or platforms. The core of that argument is that if, say, Facebook is seen as a publisher, then it is liable for what it allows to go up on its website, just as a newspaper is liable for publishing, say, libelous material. Historically, those of us who study online abuse and who advocated for its victims have argued that Section 230 removes all incentives for tech companies to tackle abuse problems on their platforms in anything other than tokenistic fashion. I no longer believe this. And the reasons get to the heart of what is going terribly wrong with the debate on free speech in 2022. Section 230 says that, quote, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider, end quote. Seems quite clear. But what is often not understood about Section 230 is something tech companies themselves know perfectly well. While it protects them from liability, it also protects their right to moderate their platforms. This hidden edge of 230's double blade was drawn into sharp relief by one of the biggest government attacks on free speech in the US of our time. Texas's House Bill 20, which proposes to ban platforms with more than 50 million monthly concurrent users from banning users or removing their posts on the basis of their viewpoint. This law has, thankfully, been halted from going into effect while a myriad of legal challenges proceed. Matt Schurz, president of the Communi Computer and Communications Industry Association, said in response to the SCOTUS decision to block the law that, quote, no online platform, website, or newspaper should be directed by government officials to carry certain speech. I emphatically agree. But it's important to understand what's really happening here, because it's at the heart of a new wave of far-right legislation that is sweeping the United States, including the Don't Say Gay Law in Florida and that state's so-called Stop Woke Act, both of which use the power of the state to impose onerous restrictions on free expression, particularly by academics, and most especially on its queer and transgender citizens. In the case of Texas HB 20, that state is attempting to force social media companies to carry certain messages as a result of the self-victimizing right-wing narrative that conservative viewpoints are supposedly systematically suppressed on such platforms. If anything, the opposite is true. Section 230, which is responsive to the unique challenges of the virtual world, recognized that open platforms operating at scale could not conceivably be liable for every utterance of each of its many millions of users, but also that it needed freedom from government interference to moderate and curate unique online communities. We've already seen what will happen with the loss of Section 230. The so-called Stop Enabling Sex Traffickers Act removed Section 230 protection from any content vaguely deemed to promote trafficking. The result? Mass denial of speech to sex workers, erotic artists, writers, and even queer people as platforms scramble to impose overly broad blanket bans on any content that they might be held liable for. The state cannot and should not force social media platforms to give the far right a platform, and the state cannot and should not force content providers to exclude sex workers from their platforms, among a myriad of other examples. 
content moderation, exercise with contingency and discretion is a form of free expression. And this brings me to my larger point. The debate on free speech in this country is almost irretrievably broken because what I just said is virtually unintelligible in the terms of that debate as it is conducted in popular forums. As I speak, laws are being passed or mooted in this country that increasingly criminalize the existence of transgender people or that place excruciatingly onerous limits on the perceived political speech of teachers and university professors. We are even witnessing laws come to fruition that would regulate the speech of doctors who discuss abortion or the speech of websites and platforms that would advertise abortion to people in states where the practice is newly criminalized. Yet, to read the front page of the New York Times is to read an opinion columnist agonizing about how the true threat to free speech is transgender people using terms like pregnant people. Or look at the Atlantic would treat us to Connor Friedersdorf's latest paroxysm about students on campus saying mean things. And of course, any number of extremely online culture writers for major newspapers and magazines will wring their hands about what YA Twitter is up to today, lamenting the downfall of society that is supposedly nigh from proliferation of mean memes about Richard Dawkins or JK Rowling. We are trapped by the anxieties of powerful epistemic elites who are not used to being challenged on their views in a public forum and who bemoan campus protest or social media criticism or debates about language, things that should be regarded as the epitome of free expression in a free society. We are trapped in the fallacy of the first speaker, where we only ever debate the rights of the first person to essay an offensive opinion and never the right of others to respond with speech. We routinely ignore the fact that free expression in the US and many other democracies entails a right to free association as well. You may say what you wish, and I have a right to say I do not endorse it. I will not associate myself with it. The latter is precisely the right Section 230 protects for platform owners and users alike. The right to associate freely or not as we wish. And because so much of the public debate that rages in august forums from open letters in Harper's Weekly to columns in New York Magazine to many academic rostrums rotates entirely around the anxieties of the already powerful and privileged, a chattering class deeply concerned about hearing from people they did not expect. The grotesque chaos that results from this is a perversion of a needful debate, the loss of so much precious intellectual energy devoted to the urgent defense of democracy and the inability to grasp what free speech is really for, to allow all citizens to talk back to the powerful without fear of government reprisal. And when the government deputizes far-right extremists and online harassment brigades for the purpose of intimidating and silencing already marginalized voices on the basis of their very immutable identities, preventing platforms and their users from exercising freedom of association, that is an intolerable burden on our First Amendment rights. But we cannot get to this understanding until our epistemic elites stop complaining about their latest anxieties about preferred pronouns and campus activists protesting speakers. We need to stop being held in thrall to the personal nightmares of rich comedians or New York Times opinion columnists and emeritus professors at Ivy League institutions, that we might set aside these childish fantasies in favor of a long overdue discussion that might just save our democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. Now we'll hear from our second speaker, Jamal Green. Jamal Green is the Dwight Professor of Law at Columbia Law School, where he teaches courses in constitutional law, comparative constitutional law, and the law of the political process. He is the author of How Rights Went Wrong, Why Our Obsession with Rights is Tearing America Apart as well as numerous articles and book chapters on constitutional law and theory. He is also a co-chair of the Oversight Board, an independent body that reviews content moderation decisions on Facebook and Instagram. He served as a law clerk to the Honorable Guido Calabresi on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit and for the Honorable John Paul Stevens on the U.S. Supreme Court. He earned his JD from law, Yale Law School in 2005 and his AB from Harvard College in 1999. Thank you for being with us for today, Jamal. Thank you. Uh, it's really good to be here. Uh, I, I find myself wanting to 
uh, to just cede the rest of my time to, to Catherine Cross to talk for another 12 minutes, um, uh, since I find what she said so compelling, um, though I suspect there may be some disagreement a bit later in the day. Um, I, I want to um, spend my initial time uh, giving a sense of how I tend to think about free speech issues and how I hope that I can encourage others to think about some free speech issues in the future. And what I'm what I'm trying to avoid, and I think this is consistent with what uh, what we just heard, uh, is um, is uh, tending to the tendency to think about these issues in two dimensions, to think about them in a kind of binary. Uh, I think it's important to recognize that, that much of what we disagree about uh, when it comes to free speech issues has the same number of dimensions and the same amount of texture um, that we find in life itself. Uh, free, ish, free speech issues don't arise in the abstract, right? They don't even typically uh, arise in the context of a law being passed by a legislature, right? They arise in the context of conflicts between people involving specific institutions, involving specific degrees of sensibility, uh, specific degrees of proportionality, specific kinds of burdens. Um, and to give a sense of what I mean by this, uh, I thought I would just imagine and catalog a, a, a range of controversies. I, I made the, these up, although some of them uh, you'll recognize. Uh, they're fact patterns. I, I came up with 16. Um, and I want you all to think about uh, just how you might adjudicate these conflicts. I don't mean in court, but in trying to think about what the right answers to these questions might be. Uh, what would you want to know in order to adjudicate these questions? What does the answer depend on? What are the relevant facts that we that we care about? So, so scenario one, I said there are 16, I'll, I'll go quickly. Scenario one, the legislature passes a law uh, criminalizing sedition, okay? Scenario two, legislature passes a law criminalizing pornography. Okay, scenario three, FBI arrests someone um, who is standing in front of a large but unarmed crowd outside the Capitol, uh, telling them that the election has been stolen, that they need to take their country back. That's scenario three. So scenario four, sanitation department fires the head of its IT team uh, because that person has been uh, uh, posting racist social media posts. Scenario five, police department <clears throat> fires a police officer because that person has chosen to tattoo a swastika to his forehead. Uh, scenario six, college administrator at a public university uh, fires a tenured professor for writing an article suggesting that race is a biological category. And they just disagree with that. <clears throat> scenario seven, the faculty, not the administrator now, the faculty at the same public university refuses tenure to a professor for writing the same article, uh, which the faculty uh, thinks is bogus. Uh, scenario eight, the admissions office of the same public university. Well, it's a, not the admissions office. I, I, this is the, uh, the dean of students, let's say, at the same public university, uh, suspends a student because that person has been using racial epithets in a social media post. Scenario nine. Same dean of students, same public university, but they don't suspend the student. They just require the student to undergo sensitivity training. Scenario 10, now we're in the admissions office of this university and public university, and they learn that a student who's applied to the university, to the university is the leader of his local Ku Klux Klan chapter. And so they refuse admission to that student. Scenario 11, local municipal theater refuses to host the speech of a Holocaust denier. They host other speech, but not this person's speech. Scenario 12, same local theater. They refuse to host an art installation of a naked man masturbating. Scenario 13, the police arrest a man who has solicited women to engage in sex acts with him for pay. Scenario 14, <clears throat> Same man, but he offers the defense that he intends to upload recordings of the sex acts to a streaming device, to a streaming service, and charge people to view them, making women the, the women actors rather than sex workers. Uh, scenario 15, a man blogs a first-person account of his sex life uh, with his ex-girlfriend without her consent. Uh, he is sued for invading her privacy. 
scenario 16, same man does the same thing, but he uses photos and videos uh, instead of writing about uh, his sex life. So that's the 16 scenarios. I just, I could, I could come up with 50 more um, or 100 more. We, we probably all could. And my concern is that when we engage in free speech debates, we tend to ask whether, quote, the government is burdening speech on the basis of its content or on the basis of its viewpoint. And if it is, then the strictest of scrutiny applies because we all know that free speech is the most important right of all. It's the first among equals or something like that. Uh, all of the examples I've suggested involve public actors burdening speech on the basis of content or viewpoint. Maybe without, maybe, maybe this, the, the, well, I think at least arguably they all involve uh, public institutions burdening speech on the basis of content or viewpoint. But it's facile in my view to think of all of those situations as simple binaries in which strict scrutiny must apply or not apply. Right? Some of the cases may be easy, right? The first one, the legislature criminalizing sedition is imposing the harshest of sanctions in a situation in which we should be deeply concerned about the government trying to protect itself from criticism. Uh, penalization of core political speech is, raises the most urgent of First Amendment concerns, as we all know. The problem is that we tend to talk about free speech as if that's the paradigm case, right? That's the interesting problem uh, for which strong free speech norms are the solution. Uh, I, I believe very deeply in strong free speech norms, but I also believe that cases as clean as a legislature passing a law banning sedition uh, are outliers, um, at least in the United States. Um, these are the kind of pathological cases, uh, in the words of my colleague Vince Blasi. Uh, and I don't find it particularly productive to structure free speech doctrine around the assumption that the government is pathological. Uh, governments do all kinds of things. Some of them are bad, some of them are good, right? So the problem is that it makes it, makes it look like hard cases are easy cases and that easy cases are hard cases. And it denies decision makers the resources needed to understand when threats to free expression are serious threats uh, and when they are less serious threats. And so I, I go back to the questions I asked when I went into my, my long string of examples, which is what would you want to know um, in order to adjudicate or decide these cases? Right? What does the answer depend on? What are the relevant facts? For I think precisely one of the, those cases, one of those 16, the sedition case, which again is the one that's least likely to arise in um, the modern United States. I think the relevant facts are whether a government actor is burdening speech on the basis of viewpoint, right? As we, we, if, if we know that, we know that this is a problematic law, that's the core case that the current paradigm is built around. But in all of the other cases, we, we wanna know a bunch of other things, right? We wanna know, for example, what is the nature of the burden, right? Is it a prison? or is it sensitivity training, or is it something in between? Amazingly, First Amendment doctrine in the United States does not ask this question, right? A burden is a burden, we're, we are told. Uh, this leads what are, to what are, in my view, absurd results in some cases, such as when, for example, a public campaign finance law in Arizona is said to violate the First Amendment because giving money to a publicly financed candidate in response to greater spending by a privately financed candidate burdens the speech of the privately financed candidate, right? This is an actual Supreme Court case. In addition to the nature of the burden, we should want to know the nature of the public institution, right? What kind of government actor are we talking about? Uh, what is its mission? What are its legitimate goals and objectives? What, what is its level of expertise? What are the indicia of trust in the decisions that it makes? a university structuring or trying to structure its learning environment is not the same thing as a police officer trying to get uh, allegedly dangerous people off the streets. We should want to know the relationship as well between the objective and the burden, right? So even if we believe that the right to free speech is more important in some abstract sense than for example, the right to public decency, what do we do when we have a 1% burden on speech and a 99% burden on public decency? Um, that, that's um, not the same as if those percentages were reversed, um, even if we think that in some abstract sense, we can say one is more important than the other. Right? This I think is the masturbation case implicitly, even if we don't want to admit that, it's the, that, that that's what's happening, that we're actually making a judgment about the degree of burden on particular kinds of interests. So in, in short, uh, 
free speech cases in the real world, when they make contact with reality, tend to be less cases about speech in the abstract, and more often cases about facts, and cases about um, relative institutional competence, and cases about proportionality. Right, speech is everywhere, especially in the modern e economy, which is an information economy. Burdens on speech are therefore also everywhere. And so in order to think sensibly about those burdens and when we should be very worried about them and when we should be less worried about them, we should be spending more time thinking about standards of proportionality in a transparent and open-minded way, rather than pretending that speech is speech is speech and therefore always a Trump. Thank you. Thank you, Jamal. Um, now we'll hear from our third speaker, Eric Heinz. Eric Heinz is a professor of law and humanities at the University of London. After earning his JD degree cum laude from Harvard Law School, Eric published his first book entitled Sexual Orientation, A Human Right. Since that time, he has published eight books and authored or, or been interviewed for over 150 scholarly and media pieces. His two most recent books are about free speech. This past April, he published a book with the MIT Press entitled The Most Human Right, Why Free Speech is Everything. And in 2016, he published Hate Speech and Democratic Citizenship with Oxford University Press. In addition to teaching and research, he has advised several intergovernmental and non-governmental organization on human rights. Thank you for being with us here today. Eric. Thank you, can you hear me, yeah? Okay, good. Uh, yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, Kristen, for um, for this uh, invitation and for this opportunity to be with such esteemed colleagues. It's it's a true pleasure and a nice way to start easing myself back into the new academic year. Um, now, what um, I, I think it's already clear from uh, my two predecessors that free speech is a vast uh, area, and there's no way one can. Uh, explore all of its facets in simply a brief and informal discussion. So I want to really focus on the concept of democratic discussion. And of course, I can't even say everything or even many things about that. But what I mean by democratic discussion is simply to put it concisely, expressing general ideas to general audiences. Now, again, I know this can mean many things and uh, I'm happy to hammer that out a bit more later on, but I think we all have a good sense of what this is, right? If we want to have an argument uh, or a debate about abortion rights, about the death penalty, about drug use, about the thousands of issues we fight about every day, democratic discussion is our ability to enter those debates. Now, um, I'd like you just to do a bit of a thought experiment. Yeah? Imagine that you are in a room uh, full of people. They don't know you. They don't know any of your opinions, right? And you would like to get up in front of them and persuade them about any of those issues, right, that I mentioned, about any issues that, that you somehow feel is important to the democratic conversation, to lawmaking, and so forth, right? Uh, so you want to get up and talk to a room of people about your anti-racist views, your environmental protection views, whatever it may be, yeah? But then imagine um, that just as you're about to get up and speak in front of these people, a gunman, right, comes and puts a gun to your head, right, and whispers in your ear that you must say what you were going to say anyway. So, for example, say that you wanted to give, to, to, to give a speech about your views on racism, right? Uh, you, know, you wanted to give a spe an anti-racist speech, huh? and the gunman gets up and puts a gun to your head and whispers in your ear that you have to give an anti-racist speech. And, and everyone sees this is going on. They all see the gunman putting the gun to your head, right? Now, in some ways, the gunman has achieved the opposite of what you wanted, because now the people will never know if this is what you were going to say anyway, or maybe even the opposite. Yeah, um, and, other, and, and so I'm really just making a very, very simple point. The moment that there's an element of coercion, um, of, of, of coerced speech, just like with coerced silence, right? There's going to be doubt about the sincerity with which you can even persuade. In other words, you can't persuade, you're barred from being able to persuade, right? Even if 
again, the gunman puts the gun to your head and you say what you would have said anyway, right? You are no longer free to do that in a persuasive way because nobody will understand whether you are in fact sincere or simply speaking under coercion. Now, if we take away, so and to put this very simply, when you're obeying the gunman, you're obeying a prior rule, right? Which would not normally have existed, right? Which constrains your freedom to speak. Now, if we take away the gunman, which is, a, an element of physical coercion, of material coercion, nevertheless, we replace it simply with a rule which dictates that you may or may not say a certain thing. Well, okay, the element of coercion is gone, so you could just stay silent, right? But of course, that's not an attractive op uh, option in a democratic conversation where you might actually have something to say, right? The only other alternative is that you, if there's a prior rule that you have to follow it, in other words, it's going to constrain your speech, right? So either way, to the extent of such prior rules, right, which would be, I won't call them content-based, I think that's, uh, that's a, a misleading concept, I'll call them viewpoint-based. To, the to the extent of any viewpoint-based uh, viewpoint constraint, the democratic dialogue simply becomes impossible. Um, now, I think if we look at uh, a, a lot of the free speech uh, uh, discussions today, there's one principal objection to everything I've just said, right? Everything I've just said has cast doubt on the possibility of a prior viewpoint-based rule to the possibility of democratic conversation. Now, I think the leading objection to what I just said would run something as follows. It would be that, well, if we look at power dynamics in the world, right, they don't allow a free and open democratic conversation anyway, right? Power, power, uh, power dynamics are such that whites speak more loudly than blacks, that heterosexuals speak more loudly than homosexuals, right? That, that heteronormative speaks more lo loudly than trans. And you could, again, you could, uh, uh, that men speak more loudly than women. And again, I think this will be familiar to all of you, right? It's right, it's this problem of power dynamics, right? And so many people, uh, 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 and certainly, I think in Europe today, who continue to advocate for viewpoint based restrictions on speech, I, I think this is kind of ultimately where all of those arguments lead. The arguments are are articulated in many ways. Uh, Catherine, uh, 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 for example, um, referred to uh, the case of Germany and, the, and, and its doctrines of militant democracy. But ultimately, I think, uh, however these um, objections are articulated, they very much lead back to this problem of power dynamics, which could falsify the democratic conversation, which do exclude people, they, which do exclude the least powerful, even when um, um, uh, they purport to be formally equal. That would be, I think, the leading objection to, uh, to, 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 to my objection to prior viewpoint selective restrictions. Um, and I think, however, that that objection based on power differentials, although I don't dismiss it, I think it's real. I think these power di differentials do exist, and we need to find lots of other ways to redress them and to and to bring people into the democratic conversation. So I don't dismiss the concern. Um, the problem it, here is a bit of a slippery slope one. And again, I know that slippery slope arguments are not always that persuasive, but unfortunately, I think in this case, a slippery slope argument really is because um, uh, 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 because um, uh, the, the problem with this objection based on power dynamics is that it can apply to any argument which is important. It doesn't only apply to trivial arguments, which would be a more persuasive concern about a slippery slope argument. To put this all much more simply, right? Any social controversy, any disputed problem, you name it. Again, I, I just listed a whole bunch of them, right? Whether it's drug abuse or poverty or abortion rights or whatever else, these always involve power dynamics, 
there is always the, the likelihood, right, that the more powerful speaker will have the louder voice. That's the way wealth and power always work, right? So the problem is with this power dynamics argument is that you, you couldn't really have any social controversy, right? Because there would always be the less powerful side, right, who would have to be protected. Uh, right. A again, I know that this sounds a bit too much like a standard slippery slope argument, but again, there's 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 no simply trivial set of cases to which it applies. It will always apply to important cases. And if we look at the entire history of social movements, right, whichever they may be, right, again, in, in, in America, the civil rights movement, in Europe, rights for Jews, right, again, rights for women, rights for gays, the whole, again, I think you all know them very well. All of them came from, all of these movements came from people who, in a sense, were dehumanized, who were not fully human in law or in society. Um, uh, uh, and again, I think Nadine will surely be speaking a lot more about this. This, this was the very reason why they were using free speech, right? Um, uh, 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 and, and, and so I think this problem of, 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 of unequal power dynamics, um, although, as I said, it's, be, it's kind of the ultimate argument that, that many of the others lead to, it, it just doesn't work because there's no stopping point. Right, as I say, there's no meaningful social controversy, which will not somehow include uh, a skewed power dynamics. And so this is why I think I have to now come back to, um, you know, my, uh, my, my, uh, my first point about uh, the imposition of a prior viewpoint selective rule, which is that you cannot distinguish a prior rule from the actual discussion itself. Uh, I, I think a lot of the people who, you know, who advocate for, uh, for these sorts of viewpoint selective restrictions, many of whom I very much admire, people like Philip Hyman and so forth, um, or Steve Hyman, excuse me, and many others, um, uh, Richard Delgado, Mary Matsuda, you know, many of them have been in this for a long time. Again, I do understand what they're trying to get at. Um, they're, they're trying to imagine this sort of moment of prior respect, of prior human dignity, which must be in place before any conversation even starts. And what I'm saying is that that's just not possible. The conversation has already started once you impose the prior viewpoint selective rule. And therefore, you can't dissociate, you can't divorce the prior rule, which would be, you know, how are we going to be situated before we even jump into the conversation from the conversation and its outcome themselves. Um, so th that was essentially the point I wanted to make. Again, I know it leads into a lot of sub issues, and maybe we'll pick up on some of those. But um, if that didn't sound like complete babbling, then uh, I'll quit while I'm ahead. And thank you very much for your attention. Oh, Crystal, I think you need to unmute, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> we'll hear from our uh, fourth speaker, Nadine Strassen. Um, New Nadine Strassen is a New York School of Law Emerita, um, past national president of the American Civil Liberties Union from 1991 to 2008. The senior fellow from, with FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, and she's a leading expert and frequent speaker, media commenter, on constitutional law and civil liberties. She's testified before Congress on multiple occasions. She serves on the advisory boards for the ACLU, Academic Freedom Alliance, Heterodox Academy, and National Coalition Against Censorship. The National Law Journal has named Strassen one of America's 100 most influential lawyers. Her 2018 book, Hate, Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech, Not Censorship, has been selected as the common read by Washington University in 2019 and Washburn University in 2022. Thank you for being with us here today. Thank you so much, Crystal and Ed, for organizing such a wonderful, stimulating gathering. Uh, I uh, want to say that I, I, Crystal asked me to talk about my book and the ideas of my book, and I promised to do that. Uh, but I have to say just a couple of words about the really provocative um, presentations that have been made by my co-panelists. And speaking of which, I want to thank Eric and Jamal, who were so kind as to do public interviews with me in 
London and New York, respectively, when my book first came out. And um, to thank Catherine for this opportunity to engage with you for what passes as face-to-face -face, um, in this pandemic age. And I want to thank Catherine because she started by talking, giving a couple examples of where she had changed her mind on these issues. And I think that's so impressive. And one of the things that I would like to ask all of us is, you know, we've all been thinking about these issues for so many years. How have we changed our minds? You know, and if we haven't, I think that says something uh, pretty interesting. I'll use a neutral term. Um, let me just suffice it to say from my own perspective, my mind has changed um, pretty much in the direction that Jamal was signaling, I did used to see a lot of these issues as binary. Uh, the more I got into them, the more I realized that that is not true. Uh, where I think I disagree with Jamal is I think that the law itself uh, acknowledges uh, that the importance of facts and circumstances and context. We may disagree with how the Supreme Court or other justices uh, apply the context-based um, tests about what speech is protected and what's not. But I think they are struggling to take factors into account, including the nature of the government institution, the nature of the burden, and others that Jamal laid out. And if you get into the lower court decisions, you tend to see that um, quite extensively. Uh, before I launch into talking about the points in my book, I, I do want to um, disagree with one point that, that Catherine made, which I think is, is really important. I, I, I'm on board with her about the terrible threats that we're facing to free speech from government. So Jamal, yes, we that is that paradigm case is unfortunately still in effect in many states around this country, a growing number that are passing just straightforward, you know, sensorial laws, often prior restraints. And it's, it's excellent that the First Amendment is there uh, to make those laws at least presumptively unconstitutional. Um, I also agree with Catherine that um, abrogating or even severely modifying Section 230 would do much more harm than good, including to minority voices and viewpoints. Where I respectfully disagree with her is the remarks about a term that she didn't use but was clearly referring to, um, so-called cancel culture. Uh, uh, again, going back to Jamal's concept of a binary, I don't think that um, we have to choose between the kind of robust criticism and challenges that Catherine was appropriately defending. That is very much uh, an aspect of free speech. In fact, it's the whole premise of, of my book. Um, hate why we should resist it with free speech, right? So I'm advocating robust counter speech that hopefully will, if it's successful, will have an impact of silencing at least a lot of hate speech. So I could not um, agree more that it would be wrong to call that a form of censorship. But I think this is not a binary issue. And I think there is a question of proportionality to use another term that Jamal referred to, uh, when we see not the powerful people who can fight back against attempts to silence them altogether, the, uh, the people that were, some of whom were referred to by Catherine, including Dave Chappelle. Um, but unfortunately, uh, there is a lot of evidence, including evidence that's been painstakingly documented by fire, case by case, of unpowerful, untenured, not even tenured track faculty members who are having their entire careers obliterated uh, because of something that they said. And it's not just a matter of criticizing the idea, but it is literally trying to silence the person from even continuing to participate in a conversation, at least as a member of the campus community. So I, I hope we'll get more into these kinds of issues, but I, I promise, my goodness, to turn to uh, my assigned topic, which was um, the, the, the thesis of my 2018 book. Uh, and basically, I would I want to emphasize that, you know, the only verb in the title of this book is resist hate, why we should resist it with free speech, not censorship. So my overriding goal is the promotion of human rights, dignity, equality, diversity, and inclusivity. 
And I'll just use the term equality to, to, to summarize all of those interrelated positive goals. There, I completely agree with the Delgados and Matsudas and others who have been referred to by, by Eric, um, that, um, that that is the goal that we are seeking. I just very strongly disagree with the proposed solution of censoring beyond the amount of restriction that is already permitted under American law. And to Jamal's point, I really did not realize until I got into the weeds of thinking about and writing the book, how very, very much hate speech and other controversial speech may and is subject to restriction, I think appropriately under American law. And so I, you know, feel embarrassed about all the debates I've participated in in the past, you know, should hate speech be censored or not? Should disinformation be censored or not? And the answer is, it all depends, right? And I agree with Jamal that it depends not only on what test we apply, uh, but what facts and circumstances are fed into what is deliberately and designedly a fact-specific analysis. And um, so I, you know, looking at a lot of the facts uh, involved in a lot of the hate speech cases around the world, uh, Catherine referred to, to Germany, as, to, as did Eric, um, one tends to see that, unfortunately, no matter how desirable the goals are underlying these laws, uh, as, as um, Eric also indicated, uh, they too often end up doing far more harm than good, both Catherine and Eric, Catherine referring to SOSTA, SESTA, FESTA, FOSTA, uh, you know, the acronym um, was intended to benefit, to protect women against sexual abuse and ended up doing exactly the opposite. So the three major points that um, I make in, in my book, and I'm not gonna have time to elaborate on them uh, very much, is number our number one, contrary to much misunderstanding, robust free speech principles do not absolutely protect all hate speech, but they rightly allow government to restrict the hateful speech that is the most dangerous, namely uh, what is usually called the emergency principle, directly causing or threatening imminent specific serious harm while outlawing the censorship that is the most dangerous, the kind that um, Eric referred to, namely viewpoint-based censorship. The second point is that censorship that goes beyond the emergency principle um, is not effective in promoting equality and may well be counterproductive. Germany, again, is a tragically a positive, you know, good example of that with very, very strict anti-hate speech laws and yet an upsurge not only in hateful political parties and ideology, but also in anti-Semitic, anti-immigrant, anti-refugee violence of a very severe nature. Uh, and my third point is that non-sensorial measures are more effective in promoting equality. Uh, Crystal asked me to concentrate on that, so I will use my remaining uh, three minutes to uh, amplify that. I tried to the best of my ability, and I'm still gathering every time there's um, uh, another case, I, I, I stay on top of it. Um, I tr uh, and I remain convinced that no matter how well intended, the hate speech laws do more harm than good. But on the positive side, I have been so much more impressed by the power of uh, pro-free speech approaches, not only so-called counter speech, but also anti-discrimination laws, um, conspiracy lawsuits of the sort that we saw in Charlottesville, Virginia, um, the use of um, hate crimes or bias crimes statutes. And I want to get back to counter speech because the examples of the multiple kinds of counter speech that have been so dramatic continue to, to multiply. Counter speech is often misunderstood because I think people sometimes think that means that you're putting the burden on those who are disparaged to engage in it. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's the responsibility of all of us to proactively, constantly champion uh, values of equality. And I think, you know, one of the 
the silver linings of uh, the horrible uh, murders of George Floyd and others. We know they've been going on forever, but uh, that movement has finally gotten traction and attention and spurred a, you know, unprecedentedly pan um, racial movement for racial justice. Um, that, that, that was spurred in part by responses against dramatic examples of racist speech, such as we saw in Charlottesville. So far from galvanizing white supremacists, I think it really has um, had a very positive motivating impact for the rest of us to engage in not only counter speech, but also anti-racist activism at every level. So more speech, uh, including from my wonderful co-panelists. Thank you, Nadine. Um, I'd like to thank each of our four panelists for sharing their opening remarks. Now we'll begin a response round during which each of our panelists will have an opportunity to respond to any points of interest raised by their fellow panelists. We'll encourage our speakers to use this time as an opportunity to clarify sites of divergent and convergent interpretations. I'd also like to encourage our panelists to use their time to post questions. Um, I'll give each of our speakers three to five minutes for this and the order in which they delivered their opening remarks, starting with Catherine. Thank you so much, Crystaline. Uh, so certainly Nadine gave some very thoughtful responses to what I said, for which I'm extraordinarily grateful. It gives me the opportunity to clarify some ideas, which I think pivot off of uh, Jamal's excellent framework for understanding the myriad of free speech debates. I think that certainly, there's a lot to be discussed with so-called cancel culture. I myself have participated in discussions and forums about it. I've essayed about it from platforms like Wired and so on. I do think it is an actual problem. What I dispute is how it is popularly framed. And this is why I talked about sort of the nightmares of the already powerful that predominate in mainstream media and have created a climate for discussing this that is utterly toxic. Like I focused, for instance, in my own work on like online harassment and so-called cancel culture on people like Isabel Fall, who was a you know transgender woman, sci-fi writer who was essentially scared back into the closet by a hideous backlash against a short story that she wrote for Clark's World. Uh, I sexually identify as an attack helicopter, which was a satire of transphobia and also the military industrial complex but was widely misinterpreted and you know there was this largely left of center backlash against her that was actually quite devastating uh, the most of the proponents are the, the people who are sort of professional culture warriors on so-called cancel culture neither know nor care about her right that's something that they don't think about instead they're vastly more concerned with billionaires who live in castles and uh, wealthy politicians and ex-presidents and so forth. They are concerned with building ring fences around the, the hurt feelings of the already very powerful. We are, and that's what I mean about the nightmare that we are enthralled to, is that time and time again, when we look at these issues as discussed in the in major newspapers, it's centering on that, not even the, the cases that Nadine alluded to which I do think are serious. And I think that there is merit to having open discussions about how to, how to have disagreements in more constructive ways. Because I think as, as Jamal rightly pointed out, discourse about speech and a lot of the debates about speech are about these informal mechanisms of deciding what is and is not acceptable in our society. Right. The government is not necessarily directly involved in much of this. And I think that that is worth talking about, but it's extraordinarily messy. And what I find frustrating uh, is, you know, you, Nadine, have uh, obviously participated a lot in uh, speech debates on campus. One of the things that I worry about is that moral panics about campus activism have led directly to things like the Stop Woke Act. And so has there been a disproportionate focus? on some of these marquee episodes to the point of creating a climate that is actually leading to the you know, government restricting speech on campus, precisely because you know, out of control leftist woke students are a threat to, to free speech and all of that. And I worry deeply 
about the framing of these debates. That's why I've sort of, what I was pushing for was a shift in emphasis, a shift in accent, where the italics are in these discussions. Not to say that some of these things aren't problems, but I think that, you know, this meme has been overemphasized to the point of uh, now creating a ferment behind actual state level restrictions on speech, uh, chasing to some degree a phantom. But uh, yeah, that's sort of that's sort of where I'm at on this. It's really about where is the emphasis? Where is the epistemic elite discussion happening? What is it about? Who's included? Who's excluded? And, you know, as someone who's participated in uh, a forum at Smith College entitled uh, Calling in the Calling Out Culture a few years running, I absolutely believe that there needs to be a real discussion about this. It's just not happening in most public fora because we're trapped in, you know, J.K. Rowling's nightmare. Thank you, Catherine. Um, now we can hear from Jamal. Thank you, and uh, thank you to, to Catherine and to Nadine and to Eric for, for wonderful remarks. Uh, I'll also thank uh, Nadine for reading and blurbing my own book. Um, I, I want to make a general point that intersects with some of what Catherine talked about, uh, and then uh, offer a couple words in response to Eric and Nadine. Um, the, the general point uh, is something that I, that I think hasn't maybe quite been put on the table and is worth putting on the table, which is um, the degree to which, whether and to what degree, um, modern social media uh, alters the costs and benefits of various kinds of speech restrictions. I, obviously, there are a lot of different views about this, uh, but I really do think, and, I, and consistent with my earlier remarks, I think it's more complicated than yes, it does or no, it doesn't. But but I do think that that the speed and scale of the of the internet um, is a paradigm shift. Um, no one, not, not everyone agrees with that, um, but I do. Um, uh, the, the, when we're talking about um, content on the scale of a billion posts a day on Facebook or you know, a, a few hundred million tweets, uh, then trying to regulate that kind of behavior, and that can be, it can go viral in, in minutes, trying to regulate that kind of behavior can't be done on a tweet by tweet basis or on a post by post basis, um, which means that it has to be done at, at, at some scale, which means that it has to be done in part by machines, meaning it has to be done algorithmically, which means we're really talking about what are the kinds of rules that we use, as opposed to the application of the rule in particular cases. And that's um, always going to be over, over broad, it's always going to be uh, under broad, right? So, we're used to talking about being having to be precise about speech regulation in the context of regulating primary behavior um, uh, by governments paradigmatically, but uh, social media is a very different context. Uh, I do think clarity about the rules, some forms of due process are very important in this context, but we do need to think differently about, uh, about uh, case by case adjudication. Uh, the, the point I wanted to make to, to Eric in response to his provocative hypothetical um, is, and this won't surprise him probably that I'm making this point, which is uh, which is someone pointing a gun to one's head um, and telling them uh, to speak is is not a very realistic scenario. It's very helpful in trying to think and trying to you know abstract away from particular situations to develop um, uh, to develop, develop some priors about these things. So it's not a criticism of the mode of engagement. It's to say, that you know, I, 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 we're always dealing with mild forms of social pressure when we speak. Um, uh, we we live in a society, right? So, I I, I want to know. I always want to know if we're talking about a viewpoint-based rule, and whether it's a good idea or not. I need to know what rule we're talking about. Right? I need to know who promulgated it. I need to know why they promulgated it. I need to know what its parameters are. Uh, I need to know what the consequences of breaking the rule might be. Uh, so. You know, two viewpoint-based rules. One is you know, don't insult your college roommate with racial epithets, or you'll get sensitivity training. And another is don't publish an op-ed criticizing the government, or the brown shirts are going to show up and arrest you. You know, both of those are viewpoint-based rules. Um, one of those, in my view at least, uh, su uh, supports pluralistic democratic deliberation, and the other doesn't. Um, neither, I think, is an unimportant or trivial case. Um, 
what I think differentiates them um, doesn't need to rely on a narrative about power dynamics, um, although it could, it doesn't need to. Uh, it's just a difference in institutional situation. And so I, I, I have trouble, at least in this context, sort of abstracting away from the difference between those two scenarios and all the things in between them, uh, since they point for me in precisely opposite directions. Uh, to Nadine and her exchange with Catherine on university cancel culture, well, one thing, and, and, and elsewhere, um, but it certainly happens lots in the university context. My big worry here, and, and I think like all of us, I, I, I think there is a problem with people overreacting to speech, um, but I, I worry that we only know the numerator and we don't know the denominator, right? Which is to say that every time there's some ham-handed response to someone's speech or some students or some administrator um, uh, doesn't do the right thing, we're gonna hear about it from FIRE, we're gonna hear about it from the Academic Freedom Alliance, we're gonna hear about it from the Washington Free Beacon, it's gonna be sh show up on social media. But of all of the instances in which administrators and faculty and students are complete models of tolerance and respectful counter speech, um, which is the overwhelming majority of my experiences as, as an academic. I'm not suggesting that I'm necessarily uh, a, a, a representative, I don't know, <laughs> right? But, but I, it's just like not, in my universe at all, um, uh, other than on social media, where I see people getting really upset about things. And so I, I, it's not that it's not a problem. It's that I worry that we just don't have any sense of proportion or magnitude. And my own kind of kind of intuitive sense and intuitive based on experiences in the academy is that people in academic institutions are way more tolerant of speech that they disagree with or are uncomfortable about than in virtually every other aspect of our lives. Uh, and so I, I, I worry a lot that you then you kill you throw the baby out with the bathwater. You end up riling people up in ways that end up being dangerous, as Catherine suggested, uh, to, to sort of kill off an institution that might be functioning very well. Um, maybe I'll I don't maybe I should stop there. I don't know how long I've been talking, but I I did want to say one way in which I think I've changed my mind because Nadine prompted us to try to do that, and it's it's um, I, I I I I I am more and this won't surprise you. I'm I'm more tolerant, constitutionally speaking, of restrictions on speech. I'm, I'm not, I think, any more tolerant than I was about whether they're good, good ideas or not. I think it's usually a bad idea to restrict speech, including in, the, including in lots of contexts that I've already talked about. But I, I've noticed, and I worry about this, that constitutional rights talk can be in tension with the values of free exchange, that free, free speech rights are meant to, to, to to protect, right? So when you say that it's protected by free speech norms, we start arguing about whether it's speech or not. Um, and we start getting mad because someone's rights were violated or we think someone's rights were violated instead of actually trying to persuade each other about whether some policy or some speaker is saying good, persuasive, interesting, valuable things or not. Uh, and I do worry about that uh, uh, and worry that maybe we should be spending a bit more time arguing about whether things are good or bad rather than rather than whether they're unconstitutional or not. So I'll stop. Thank you, Jamal. Um, now we'll hear from Eric. Yeah, thank you. Well, God, lots to think about that. Um, um, and I, I would hate for us to all go away with the impression that we might all end up agreeing that, I mean, that would be terrible. So let me just kind of throw something in there. Um, picking up a little bit on what Jamal just said, uh, because I guess I had tried to start with um, some of these points in my 2016 book, which my first chapter is entitled Value Pluralism, and it very much starts with this idea that, yeah, you, um, the world seems very unbinary, right? There always seem to be lots of factors, lots of context, lots of situations, speeches of very different types and so forth. Um, uh, um, but one of the points I tried to get to in that book is that it can't only ever be entirely open-ended. Because um, if it is, then this concept that a number of us have used now of democratic dialogue then has no meaning. Democracy itself loses any meaning if value pluralism is entirely open-ended. It can be open-ended to a very high degree. I have no I agree with this and I have no problem with it. And that's 
largely what the law is there to do in difficult cases. Um, and this is why I, I, I have proposed uh, in a lot of my writing the concept of viewpoint absolutism, which is something very different from free speech absolutism. I think we probably all agree that free speech absolutism is, a, is, is impossible within any legal order. The most libertarian legal order could never be free speech absolutist. It's a, it's a non-entity. If that's not clear, I'm happy to explain that later. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, but be that as it may, um, uh, <clears throat> so 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 once we accept the idea that that free speech absolutism is essentially unthinkable within the bounds of any legal order, nevertheless, I do think there is an absolute. I do think there is one binary without which, again, it all just becomes open-ended and the very concept of democracy loses meaning. And that's why, that's what I refer to as viewpoint absolutism, right? The idea that solely, a solely viewpoint-based criterion, right? A viewpoint-based criterion could be linked to some other non-viewpoint-based criterion for a limiting speech, and that could be entirely legitimate. But a solely viewpoint-based criterion um, again, I'm not saying we could never have one, particularly if we're looking internationally. I can think of situations where it might be a necessity to preserve life or, 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 or to pre preserve national security or some, some such thing, but it always necessarily pro tanto delegitimates democracy. Pro tanto, to use Robert Post's, uh, 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 I, I think, very important notion, it doesn't completely delegitimate uh, democracy, it delegitimates the democratic discussion to the extent of the restriction. It is never democratically legitimate. There is no conceivable world in which it could be democratically legitimate, even if it might be necessary on other grounds for preservation of life, limb, and so forth. And that is the one binary that I will insist on, while I'll take open-endedness for all the rest and value pluralism for all the rest. I'll just throw that out there. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Um, we can hear from Nadine now. I tried to set my timer, but I've failed, so I'm going to depend on somebody to show me when I've used my four minutes. Um, so I wanted to start with Jamal. Um, uh, excellent point in terms of cancel culture, which I think is um, also one that Catherine's making, that we, we really don't have a sense of the scope, I think, either of the numerator or the denominator. And FIRE, to its credit, really has been trying very, very hard, uh, not only to amass as much information and detail about every single incident that's been reported in the press or elsewhere, and they have a very impressive database online where you can uh, look at all these numbers. They're starting with faculty, and then they're going to move to students. Uh, but also FIRE, Heterodox, Knight Institute, uh, many others have been conducting surveys to try to fill in the denominator, and people can quibble about how the questions are phrased, but uh, usually the questions are asking, uh, do you feel comfortable expressing a minority viewpoint or an unpopular viewpoint or disagreeing with uh, faculty members or disagreeing with students? And sadly, there's a consistent pattern of people across the ideological spectrum, students as well as faculty members, reporting that they are self-censoring, not from using racist epithets, but from even discussing certain public policy issues with race being the number one taboo sensitive issue and gender uh, and sex being number two, understandably, because these are such really important issues. And um, one of the patterns that I have found, so uh, what's really interesting, this accords with your experience, Jamal, and my uh, observation, uh, we faculty members should feel very proud because the students report that they do not feel any pressure from faculty members. They do not feel that faculty members are discriminating against them on the basis of viewpoints. They do not fear retaliation from faculty members. They are afraid of peer pressure. That is what is exerting the, the silencing impact. Um, the other pattern I've seen, which I consider very, very worrying, although fascinating, uh, is that there are two groups that even more than the others report that they are engaging in self-censorship about entire topics and perspectives. And in no particular order, they are conservative students 
and Black students. You know, and both of those break my heart because we want all of our students, regardless of identity and regardless of ideology, to feel equally empowered to participate fully in the, in the discussion. This goes back to, this is something else that I have matured in um, uh, in the last few years as I think about free speech. Uh, for me, it is definitely not enough, even if the Supreme Court had a perfect scorecard on how I think they should interpret the First Amendment, that's not enough for us to have a meaningful exercise of free speech. It has to be uh, robustly available for everybody, regardless of education, regardless of resources. Uh, we have to empower everybody to lift their voices. And I think it's a very sad signal um, that there are certain groups, um, racial and, and, and political, that feel particularly excluded. Now, to me, that suggests, you know, that there is a cause of common concern. We should get the Black law students together with the young Republicans, kind of an odd alliance, but they seem to uh, have, uh, have something in common. Well, I don't know how much time I have, so I'll just um, confine myself to, to one other point. Um, with respect to uh, Catherine, I think it's really crucial for all of us who believe in free speech to do as much as we can to do, uh, to, to, to stress that the threats, as unfortunately is the case, are coming from all points, at least in the United States, are coming from all points across the ideological spectrum. Uh, there's too much um, um, incomplete, um, you know, you mentioned the Washington Free Beacon, Jamal, I don't think they ever complain about the many liberals and progressives who are being suppressed on, camp on campus. And unfortunately, the mainstream media is not doing as good a job. Oh, I should have said that. The fire statistics show um, that about 40% of the incidents are from the, um, from the right of the speaker. About 60% of the suppressive retaliatory incidents were protected for constitutionally protected speech are coming from the left. Uh, I don't think the fact that so many of these campus incidents are coming from the right is getting nearly the amount of attention that it should. Um, so, and I think we also have to be, uh, so for those of us who are advocates, let's try to point to all of the threats. Okay, thank you, Nadine. Um, so now we'll begin a round of questions and answers with the audience um, at Remus. We'll be moderating our Q&A round after Ad poses each question. Any and all of our speakers should consider themselves invited to jump in and share their thoughts in any order. Um, Ad, uh, can you share one of the questions for us? Yes, thank you, Crystal. And I would encourage our audience to continue to use the Q&A feature to submit questions. Um, I'll give priority to issues raised by multiple audience members, and I may agglomerate multiple questions when possible. Um, I'd actually like to start off with a question of my own, a kind of a big picture question. Um, Crystal and I have talked a lot about how in the course of curating this panel discussion series, we're at a really historic moment of political polarization that we've been in in the United States for the past five to 10 years. Some argue that it's a political realignment. Some have even said that um, when looking at the United States through a kind of comparative politics lens, we've become a little bit more like some other countries that were have historically been less uh, stable, for example. Um, I say that connecting with, with some of Eric's work. And so my question to you all is, um, how, how would you frame the distinctiveness of the free speech issues that have been raised within the past five to 10 years vis-a-vis -vis the longer history of free speech issues? And how, how do you conceive of that relationship between political polarization or realignment on the one hand and then constitutional protections or societal negotiations of, of speech rights on the other. I can use your Eric to answer that. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I really could say much more than has already kind of come out of our debates. Uh, social media changed everything. Social media has completely changed the entire history of free speech, um, uh, right? I mean, just to get back to some of what was said earlier, you know, it used to be about, you know, the sort of the model of the the town hall, you know, which now just sounds so quaint. You know, I imagine most of our students have never seen the inside of a town hall. Um, uh, uh, it's, you know, free speech is now 
in the hands of private corporations, of big multinational corporations. And I think all, you know, each of uh, the speakers today somehow brought out uh, an important element of this. Uh, and that's why also something like the First Amendment or, you know, a human rights law in, in, in other democracies, again, also looks almost quaint, you know, with its sort of classical uh, political model of the citizen versus the state, when in fact, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't mean to be dismissive of that dynamic, but once you have multinational corporations involved, as Jamal said, with, you know, dealing with hundreds of millions or billions of tweets, what, at every hour, every minute, I, I can't even remember the numbers, uh, this, this just changes everything. And again, as we know, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, in addition to the shift to, 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 to not only private corporations, but very opaque corporations, right? Uh, the, you know, the impossibility of knowing how they make their decisions, with what motives they make their decisions, although we can guess a little bit about that. Um, you know, they're very complex interactions with the state. Um, but then, of course, even if we leave that aside, you know, simply the, you know, the ways in which, um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, speech is just enormously sharpened. Right. Once, you know, you, you know, you're, you know, at the safety of a keyboard at three in the morning in your pajamas. And, you know, we know that there are all sorts of uh, somebody at one conference I once attended. I can't remember who it was said, you know, social media is the world of the id with, without any ego. Right? It's just, you know, the unconscious just all spilling forward, you know, without any spilling forth, without any kind of filtering whatsoever. Uh, so I'm not sure this is a complete answer, but I think the history, you know, for now, as long as we have electronic media, is changed uh, immeasurably um, from, what, you know, from what it was uh, when, when we were all law students learning about town hall meetings. Yeah, and I, I agree. I'm oh, sorry. Nadine can go. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I absolutely agree with Eric that, you know, social media has changed everything. Like the, the very paradigm of free speech has been, I think, irrevocably altered by the proliferation of information technology. So that's why I framed my opening remarks around Section 230 and content moderation, because moderation is indeed now one of the paradigmatic free speech issues as one of these semi-formal and semi-informal norm setting collective exercises where there are power dynamics at play going in various directions and there's no easy answer. It calls very much for the contact, the uh, context that Jamal spoke about at great length in terms of adjudicating many of these uh, complex disputes. I think that it also points to the, one of the great challenges here because uh, one of the leading scholars in my field, Tarleton Gillespie, has argued, I think, quite persuasively that moderation is essential to the constitution of platforms, right? To your point, Eric, earlier about how even the most hypothetically libertarian state could not exist without some restriction on speech, neither can there be any platform on the internet that does not engage in some form of moderation. However light, however mild, there is a collectivized process of deciding what we in this online community want to be. And that is exercised partially through formal content moderation and partially through uh, the collective activism of users on a given platform. And I think to try and tie together some of what Nadine was talking about with what Ed has asked us in terms of uh, polarization, I think that part of what has led to the polarization is that minoritarian fringes, ideological fringes, speak much, much more loudly because of the internet. This has been good for some marginalized groups who are otherwise, you know, less than 1% of the population, say, but it has also been very good for Nazis. It has also been very good for the kinds of right-wing extremism that led to the January 6th insurrection, right? And that is, it's because it's allowed these sort of minoritarian tendencies to be vastly amplified by the architecture of social media, which then leaks into mainstream traditional media. Uh, and I do think that that's a problem, but also I think that it's what is skewing our perception 
of a lot of the, the debates about informal policing of speech. Nadine, uh, I was very grateful that she brought up, you know, I have my disagreements with FIRE sometimes, but I do agree that they're doing excellent work in terms of trying to catalog this and put some handles some statistics around this problem. And it's very useful and does illustrate that sometimes the popular discourse doesn't match up with the reality on the ground. Part of, and I think that part of the problem that this raises is how do we actually solve problems like the campus speech debate, right? How do we draw the line? Because what is resulting from the proliferation of social media is that lots of people have the opportunity, even if their viewpoints are not shared by the overwhelming majority of their fellows, to get together with those who do share that viewpoint and amplify it greatly. And that is their right. But what if that amplification leads to, say, some hapless adjunct professor feeling like their life has been destroyed, right? How then do you stop that without imposing a burden on the speech of that organized minority? How do you, you know, find the brake line and actually push down on the pedal? This is an issue that I've struggled with in my own analyses of social media, right, because I've examined and studied how online harassment is not the product with very much respect to Eric, like the, the stereotype of the, you know, sort of lonely nerd in his basement. That is not actually the, the progenitor of online harassment anymore. It's lots and lots of ordinary people who don't think that they're engaging in abusive behavior led by platform affordances to become specks of dust in a sandstorm. There is no break line for when too far is too far, when proportionality gets lost, right? You know, maybe someone says an offensive thing and that's terrible and there should be some counter speech, but then it goes way too far, right? And there's no easy way to stop this without burdening people's speech. You know, it is burdening counter speech. And that I think gets to the polarization issue that Ed mentioned, because these are the, di the dynamics that are causing it by emphasizing these extreme uh, diametrically opposed views, but without any as yet structural ability to moderate them beyond content moderation, which is struggling to keep up with the economy of scale that social media demands and without relying on informal mechanisms of policing that are prone to so many pratfalls that all of us have so eloquently discussed today. It's fascinating because people are like Catherine and um, you mentioned Charlton Gillespie, Daniel Citron. There are so many brilliant people who are working full, full, full time only on these issues. They have fascinating analyses of the problems. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, nobody has really advocated any specific solutions other than, you know, procedural type approaches that Jamal alluded to, such as, you know, radically increased transparency and due process. Um, so it's, um, you know, and, 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 and the people I respect the most are saying we have to be very slow in exploring everything because it is so complicated. There are going to be so many unforeseen, potentially adverse consequences. We should have more of an experimental mode. Um, let me throw just as if it's not complicated enough, one uh, other concern that I have into the hopper here. We've been talking about government censorship. We've been talking about the power of private sector actors, whether they be Twitter mobs or whether they be um, the, the tech giants themselves. Um, in your opening remarks, Catherine, you had said something about um, government deputizing certain private sector actors. And I think you were talking about, you know, the anti-woke kind of a government impetus. But it also works the other way. There are, at, there are a lot of complaints now, and I mean literally complaints filed in courts of law uh, by people, probably mostly conservatives, certainly including Donald Trump, but he's far from, from the only one. Um, who are complaining that uh, the social media have deplatformed them in various ways or, you know, subjected their messages to some kind of blocking or labeling as a result of coercive pressure from government officials and politicians. Uh, the complaints I've read are mostly about the Biden administration and Democrats in Congress. And uh, recently, a couple of those complaints have 
survived motions to dismiss for lack of state action under the First Amendment with, again, going to the uh, Jamal's point about how fact-specific all of this should be. Um, courts saying, you know, this is a very, very fact-specific, um, intense examination, but we think you've met the threshold in your complaint uh, to get to the discovery stage to see to what extent decisions that are ostensibly being made by private sector entities are really in response to government pressure or in collaboration or collusion with the government. I have no idea what the facts are going to show, but I think as a matter of theory, uh, certainly if what is purported to be private sector uh, content moderation is really being masterminded by the government, that's an extremely serious First Amendment issue. So I, I, and then I'd like to take advantage of um, Ed's invitation to ask questions. I've been dying to ask Jamal in his capacity as co-chair of the uh, oversight board, um, if, to the extent you're free to talk about it, have, you, have your opinions uh, changed on any of these issues as a result of the insight and experience you, you've gained from that unique vantage point? So having been called out, I'll, I'll say, just say a couple of things. And um, one just called directly- out, Called on. Called, called on, yes. Um, invited. Um, I'll, I'll say a, one, just one thing just directly responsive to that, and then maybe a point about the government and, and the role of the government here, which which a couple of people have uh, have talked about. The So what have I learned? You know, I, I think I'd, I would go back to what I said about this, about the scale problem and about you know in my writings and in my speech just in my, my opening conversation I talked a lot about proportionality talked a lot about being fact specific but there are contexts in which um, sort of case by case decision making uh, is not not productive and in fact is, is likely to lead to paralyzing forms of inconsistency that themselves can be unfair Right. So the demand, I think, on a social media platform has to be a demand of consistent treatment. Um, it's, I think, too much to demand that it get everything right, right, by the lights of some pre-existing um, broader um, set of, of principles. They're not going to get everything right. It's just impossible at this scale. You, you can try to make them get as many things right as possible, but but the the, the norms that I think are are the ones that you can actually make progress on are, are norms of consistency, norms of clarity, norms of due process, and, and so forth. A uh, couple of points on the government. Uh, one is, and this is, I guess, also relates to something else that I've really internalized by spending a lot of time thinking about these issues, is how different the paradigm case is from country to country or region to region. Uh, the idea of the government engaging in various forms of jawboning or um, punishing their political enemies uh, using social media in some way is uh, sort of exotic in the U.S. Um, it, it, you, Nadine, you you brought this up as like a I can't I hope this isn't happening. That's really really bad. But that's like you know in the way that in the way in which we think of on the conservative side, it's there's too much censorship, and on the progressive side, there's not enough censorship. Um, th those being the kind of paradigm battles in the U.S., you know, lots of countries, the, the battle is what is the, the government is punishing its political enemies um, using social media. Um, and, you know, we, like if, so, if, so, so if the answer is make sure that um, more things are, are taken down from the platform, well, there are going to be some governments that are going to that are going to um, exploit that in ways that are really problematic. And it's, it's, it's really hard to think about these questions across region. Where I'm going to point in a slightly different direction, though, is, is, is going back to the initial question and Eric's observations and, and Catherine's about the forms of kind of disintermediation that uh, I think all of us think has, have contributed to polarization in various ways, where intermediary institutions, the, the media being the legacy media being a big part of this, political parties being a big part of this, institutions that used to speak for people. Um, don't speak for people in nearly the same way. Um, we all have access to big platforms, uh, or large, many large, larger numbers of people have access to big platforms than they did before. That's great in a lot of ways, and it's terrifying in a lot of ways um, because of the diversity of human experience and the kinds of harms that can arise. Uh, so what do you do about that? Well, in, in throughout human history, when, we're, when we have this kind of collective problem, like you rely on government to solve it. 
um, but part of the problem in this context is we're so deeply suspicious and in lots of ways rightly suspicious about the 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 the, the, the involvement of government in the policing regulation moderation of speech but this is absolutely a situation that calls for some kind of collective response or collective action and it's really hard to figure out what that looks like in ways that we can trust it and so i think kind of the challenge of our time is to figure out how do we reinsert inter intermediaries into public life um, that nonetheless are, are trusted institutions. And I, I think that's a really hard problem. The answer isn't Facebook's the trusted institution, right? The answer isn't the Republican Party or the Democratic Party is the trusted institution. Um, but what does that institution look like? How, how do we structure it? Um, I think about, you know, Ethan Zuckerman's written a lot about, you know, um, digital public infrastructure. Are there ways of getting the government involved to take out profit motive, to take out partisan motive in some way? I don't know. Um, uh, promote media in some way. I don't know, but 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 polarization uh, is going to happen if there's no one you trust who's in between you and someone who seems to disagree with you. Uh, and uh, I don't. You know, that's that's the challenge of our time. So I'd like to pose. Uh, well, thank you all uh, for for that response. I'd like to pose two questions that relate to college campuses specifically. Uh, I'll just read them verbatim, and then anyone can jump in. The first reads as follows. Does anyone want to speak about, as Jamal and Nadine have begun to, the class dynamics behind the disproportionate responses to speech about identity, i.e. speech is violence, speech is dehumanizing? This feels especially important on college campuses, the vast majority of which are not the elite units that dominate, I'm sorry, the elite universities that dominate the coverage of quote unquote cancel culture. So that is one question regarding the class dynamics behind disproportionate responses to speech about identity. And then a second question is a little more specific is addressed to Jamal, but others might have thoughts as well. It reads as follows to Jamal. If the university in your example is state run, such as Colorado State University, could their actions be seen as representing government actions as opposed to a private university such as Grand Canyon University? So I'm happy to just start on the question that was addressed to me, um, and I have to think more about the other question, which I, which is also a challenging one. The um, the 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 a public private question certainly a public university um, is a state actor within U.S. constitutional law. Um, uh, I would not dispute or push back on the idea that it's a state actor under U.S. constitutional law. What I would say, and that and that a private university is not a state actor. What I would say is I am skeptical, and now I'm stepping stepping away from doctrine a little bit and thinking more conceptually. I am skeptical of drawing a very, very strong distinction between state and private actors in the context of certain kinds of institutions, right? So the what separates Columbia University, where I work, uh, from the City University of New York, which is a public institution, um, is much, much, much smaller. <clears throat> Right, than what separates the City University of New York from the NYPD, which are both public institutions, right? So I want to think much more about what kind of institution are we talking about? What's its role? What's it doing? What's its mission? And uh, I, I would, uh, I would be, I'm, I'm cautious about um, saying that the fact that the label public or private applies means that different norms should necessarily apply. I think it really depends on what kind of institution it is. I could just add as a uh, doctrinal matter, we've been focusing uh, mostly on the Constitution, the First Amendment in particular, but there are other sources of legal protection for free speech. And uh, FIRE has brought many lawsuits against private universities for violating student and faculty free speech, due process, and other rights. To the best of my knowledge, they have never lost a single such lawsuit on the ground that there was not legal protection. The legal protection being based on contract law uh, because these universities, including Columbia, I happen to be, my husband teaches there, I'm very familiar with its uh, excellent free speech policies. And uh, these policies that are set forth on the websites and in faculty handbooks and um, student handbooks are uh, constitute an enforceable contract 
the vast majority of universities have, private universities have voluntarily agreed to subscribe to the same First Amendment academic freedom standards that they would be required to adhere to by the Constitution were they public universities as a matter of pedagogical choice. Uh, on the first question, since it asked about class and the elite status of the university, it had long been my impression, which now has some um, data backing it up, that the controversies that have received uh, the disproportionate attention uh, Catherine referred to, and I agree with that, so, you know, you often see the same examples, just now quite old, trotted out over and over and over again. It's doubly frustrating to me because I know there are many other examples, including coming from the right against progressive ideas. Uh, but it, 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 it does seem to be disproportionately from more at more elite institutions. Uh, the statistical backing for that, looking at FIRE's data, I have not exhaustively combed through it, and I will ask one of the staff members there um, to answer that question, but they do have a list of the top 10 of the universities where there have been the most incidents and um, the incidents with the most severe punishment, and there are several other criteria. And that top 10, ironically named, it should be considered the bottom 10, the worst 10, the most concerning 10, uh, far and away dominated by Ivy League and prestigious um, liberal arts institutions, not community colleges, um, not um, state institutions, other than some of the big 10 um, are, are, are in there as well. And I'd also like to speak to that class issue because I think it's very important. Uh, and I, I think that uh, Jamal and Nadine's remarks here were particularly excellent and insightful. To add to that, uh, speaking of CUNY, like that's where I came up. I've been to a number of universities, both as a student and now as a you know, PhD student and lecturer. And my experience of, you know, the, the supposedly dreadful environment for, for campus speech has been, you know, nothing of the kind. And I, I say this particularly as a first generation student, right? My parents did not go to university. My parents, you know, we were a Puerto Rican family, very few in my family went to college. It was uh, really not the, the done thing, but I did. And I was very new to all these norms that I had to be inured to that were largely structured by uh, middle class and white uh, dominated cultures at these institutions. And my experience of the times when, you know, say call out culture or now cancel culture as it has been rebranded uh, has been particularly problematic. A lot of the time it was coming from students from wealthier backgrounds, right? Who, you know, and this might be a bit of a bold thing to say, but I think that's some of the most egregious examples of, you know, when this kind of thing comes from the left, it, it emerges from people who don't really have an experience of oppression, but who are learning about important concepts for the first time about structural oppression, but then in their eagerness to use them too quickly, perhaps uh, apply them to circumstances where there needs to be a more proportional analysis of the situation, uh, treating certain things as violence that, you know, maybe nothing of the kind and so forth. But, you know, it comes back to the larger issue that I discussed is how do you put the brake lines on that without restricting speech or without, you know, weaponizing power against students who generally have significantly less power than campus administrators and tenured faculty. It's, it is not an easy knot to unpick. I do think that there's a class dynamic to a lot of this. And I do think that the greater, the larger risk is that the moral panic about some of these more egregious cases is threatening the campus organization of more marginalized people, those first generation students, those people who do know what oppression really is, uh, what violence really is, but who are now threatened by the Stop Woke Act, and you know, I think that a lot of that, a lot of that sort of far right ferment is specifically targeted against minorities who they are deeply worried about getting an education and being able to organize and having the material resources to do so. And so, these are the 
the myriad competing concerns that I think have to be addressed in in these debates. And I, I appreciate the question about class because it is a very important issue. So we have a question here about the police and it reads as follows. Um, for those of us that are amateurs in this multifaceted debate, what definitions are you all using for free speech and how exactly are we protected? Specifically, there are very few occasions where marginalized people are protected by speaking truth to power. Laws contradict each other. For example, do we have free speech when it comes to police officers? No way. So the police were uh, listed as an example there, but it's also a broader question. I'd invite anyone to take that on. Oh, I absolutely agree with that. You know, and, and I also, uh, Nadine brought up like some of the questions that were asked on these surveys about what one feels free to express on campus. Like I have never experienced, you know, knock on wood, the rough edge of sort of like lefty cancel culture. But if I were just asked that question broadly, you know, what, you know, are you afraid to express certain views uh, on campus? I would certainly say yes, that, you know, my, I, my views towards the police are not warm and friendly. Uh, I am anti-carceral. I, you know, am a prison abolitionist. But do I feel empowered or able to talk about that in meetings at university or on or in the classroom? Kind of, sort of, maybe not. Uh, we live in a society in the U.S. that is extraordinarily carceral, extraordinarily. Uh, pro-police, at least in terms of the, the viewpoints that are permitted by mainstream institutions, and it's exceptionally hard to criticize the uh, the police and the military, even in measured ways from formal rostrums, from uh, formal institutions, and you know the people who preach the the loudest about the dangers of political correctness and so on and so forth, uh, just kind of casually ignore that. That you know one of the most politically incorrect things that you can say is to abolish the police, say, or abolish prisons, uh, and. Uh, I, and that's just at the level of like informal policing, to say nothing of how many onerous restrictions are placed on people's free expression, either by laws protecting the police that have been formalized, attempts to stop people from filming police officers doing their jobs, uh, horrible as it often is, and also the ways in which police officers informally exceed their authority constantly to police people's speech. Like, you know, uh, we talked a bit of, very briefly about the Black Lives Matter movement. Last summer, you know, uh, so, sorry, the summer of 2020, time is a bit strange now. Uh, it was a tableau of state oppression of speech, right? With truncheons, with the National Guard, with, you know, people who were by and large peacefully protesting say for a few incidents where uh, violence, I would even say, was provoked by the police. But, you know, peaceful protesters were beaten and bloodied by state actors in uniform, rapidly exceeding their authority, who will experience no accountability for that whatsoever. That is the country in which we live. And that is, I think, you know, this is another reason why I sometimes find the campus debate tedious, even as I recognize its importance, is because I, I'm like, well, we live in a country where that is happening, right? And many, many powerful people refuse to talk about it or confront it directly, as if that's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, and, you know, I, you know, I think about like reporters who lost their eyes or who were permanently injured, right, by, you know, so-called rubber bullets. Uh, the, the, the reality, one of my partners was arrested, you know, for peacefully protesting. Like, I look at what happened and I see that, you know, what was going on was that the police did not like people criticizing them. But free speech, what is it for? The most important role that it does play in a free society is in this goes to something of a definition. I will freely admit it's not the most operationalizable definition, but it is fundamentally about protecting the rights of the less powerful to speak out against the powerful and particularly against the state without reprisal. People should be free to say maybe the police are too lavishly funded without being intimidated by the police or beaten or arrested. Right. We are living in a society where the police are out of control. And that is one of the most urgent speech issues of our time. 
I, I fully agree with Catherine's assessment of the problem, and that's uh, an example I had in mind, um, uh, dissenting from Jamal's view that we don't have paradigm cases. Way I was aware of all those cases where I, I disagree with you, Catherine. Is um, you know you're never going to make up for somebody's loss of liberty, let alone loss of an eye. Uh, but the ACLU and others have brought lawsuits. To the best of my knowledge, we have won every single one of those lawsuits because the legal principles, you are absolutely correct. This is the most fundamental violation of the most fundamental, uh, import, fundamentally important type of speech in, in our democratic republic, speech criticizing government power and seeking to reform government structures. So we do have the legal mechanisms um, in, in hand to counter those abuses and to try to prevent them in advance. That said, I know I personally would feel intimidated, you know, uh, because even legal observers, as you said, and journalists have been uh, physically attacked. And even though it is completely illegal to try to stop somebody from documenting these interactions, um, again, every attempt to make it illegal for somebody to video or photograph a police has been police officer has been slapped down as a blatant violation of the First Amendment. But in the moment, if the police, you know, there's a big, strong police officer who's snatching your phone away from you or snatching it on the ground, what are you going to do? This gets back to my concern about trying to add to the robust legal protections some actual culture um, that respects freedom of speech, including within important societal institutions, including the police. In terms of discussion about um, policies on incarceration and our criminal legal system more generally, I would uh, respectfully uh, disagree to some extent with your assessment, Catherine, by saying this, that what is popular and uh, taboo on one campus is going to be very different from what is popular and taboo on another campus. There are campuses where people really are afraid to say, you know, I think we need a lot of police reform, but I don't believe in defunding the police because that leads to accusations that they're racist. Uh, and so forth. So I think, you know, it's another one of those sensitive issues, uh, along with race, immigration, gender, where uh, it would really be important for everybody to feel comfortable voicing perspectives and, and, and opening themselves to criticism for those ideas. Of course, they should not be immune from criticism, but they should not be deterred from, um, from, from entering into the discussion. And if I may uh, just respond to that, because I think it gets like to the heart of a lot of these issues. So what I was talking about really was just my own perception and that perception may not be empirically correct. I freely admit that. Uh, that was more just to illustrate a potential like um, empirical- But I share that perception. To... I would be afraid to voice my opinion in, in with NY NYPD in front of me, even knowing that the ACLU would have my back at some point. I agree. And yet that this is this is at the nub of the problem because I I agree that there can be coercive effects to being called names or to being told, well, you're prejudiced, right, or what have you. But it's the other students' right to say that's racist. Like maybe they're wrong in some empirical sense, but it, and this is sort of what I mean about the, the first speaker problem that I, I talked about, why it seems to bedevil a lot of these discussions is that, you know, that we we look at the respondent as someone who is burdening the exercise of free speech. It's yeah, it's legitimate to say, well, I'm afraid of saying this because I'm afraid of being called that. I feel the same way about any number of things, but uh, as Jamal put it, uh, borrowing a great internetism, we live in a society. And unfortunately, that's part of the, the discourse. So well, I shouldn't even necessarily say, unfortunately, people have a, a right to say that. Like if someone, you know, says that, you know, spouts uh, lies about how black people commit more crimes than white people, I can say that's, a, that is a, that's racist misinformation. And they may feel bullied by that. But I had the right to say that in response. Absolutely, I agree with that. But I think this goes to another point that Jamal made, which is let's get the debate about whether away from whether you have the right to say it, and let's discuss the ideas on their merits. Too often, um, just saying that you're a racist or some kind of you know some kind of an is or some kind of an oh 
ends the discussion about the ideas. Of course, you have the right to say it, but is it right to say it if what we want to do is have a productive exchange of ideas about these difficult issues? Uh, before we move to closing remarks, I just wanted to invite Eric and Jamal to jump in if there's anything else. Uh, no, no obligation, but if you wanted to add anything to this thread before we move to closing remarks. I, I don't really have much to add. I, 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 I think thought it was a great exchange uh, between Catherine and uh, Nadine, and I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't have much more to add either, except um, I, I do appreciate the fact that uh, um, I, I think both Catherine and Jamel in various contexts um, reminded us <laughs> the, 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 the conversation, and particularly I think Catherine's reference to, uh, to you know, to very oppressive societies um, reminds us that, um, and, and I guess maybe, maybe I tend to be more attentive to this just because my context has been very much the international human rights as opposed to just particular domestic systems, right? Which is that um, I think we're always at risk of making these debates very first world. <laughs> um, the debates about free speech in most of the rest of the universe are so different. If, if you can even get to a debate about free speech, you know? Um, uh, so, you know, which is, which is not at all to diminish, you know, the, you know, the real importance of the, 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 the controversies taking place, you know, within Western democracies. <clears throat> but, um, you know, that's, that was one of the reasons that um, I, you know, I, I, um, yeah, I followed up my 2016 book with the one that just came out um, was to kind of refocus back on, you know, that, you know, the fact that um, we, we can't let this become, you know, too sort of uh, Western, uh, you know, sort of prosperous self-indulgence and forget about the fact that there are places where, you know, you can't, you know, come out onto the street and say that, you know, that your family member has been tortured, the most basic things you can't say, you know, and, uh, uh, um, I mean, I'm sure you've all seen the, the videos, you know, uh, of, of Russians simply um, saying the most oblique things in public and this being hauled off by cops, you know, um, but, um, and that I think leads me to another point, but I, this is something that I've been working on now. I, I don't know if it's, it's of much interest, but it's something that's really been preoccupying me. It's, uh, you know, for, for a, a, a publication that, that I hope to, to have completed over the next few months, um, which is that I think the kind of Western domination of these debates, um, you know, particularly, you know, a number of us have, you know, have worked on particularly the problem of hate speech as a kind of paradigm instance of, you know, are there certain opinions simply as opinions which need to be, which need to be banned. And so much of um, the, our very conception of hatred is really on this kind of identitarian model, which is a very, very Western Thing. Now, this is ironic. You're getting, get, getting back to people like Richard Delgado, Mary Matsuda, these, you know, these people who, you know, certainly raised, you know, our awareness and provoked us to, to think more deeply about these things. But I, but I, one of my criticisms of a lot of the work is that um, the very people who were criticizing Eurocentrism actually gave us extremely Eurocentric notions of what hatred is, right? Now, if you look at so many, you know, really very oppressive of societies, um, um, you know, where, uh, yeah, fine, there is, certainly is still things like racist and sexist and homophobic. I'm not, I'm not saying that these don't exist in other places, but where, you know, um, even if it's dangerous to talk about causation, if we look at correlation between speech and violence, where we've had, you know, a whole 20th century and going right up to the present of, of government orchestrated speech, which, again, leaving aside causation, which correlated to tens of millions of deaths and of damaged lives using not things like, you know, a racist invective or homophobic or what have you, but, you know, things like, uh, you know, spy, traitor, parasite, right? You know, the, you know, the language of a lot of very repressive countries, you know, where, um, you know, these were part of campaigns of blanket political repression. Now, why did we never call those hate speech? 
at least as many, if not far more lives have been lost through it. This is one of the things I'm writing on now, right? Why did we end up with such a Eurocentric concept of hate speech, precisely from the people who were telling us not to be so Eurocentric? <laughs> right? And, uh, you know, so um, uh, again, all of this is just, you know, my kind of my, 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 my gut response to, you know, I think what was rightly said before about the idea that um, when we're talking about free speech, we can't completely forget you know, what it's like to really live in a country where, you know, the kind of debates we've been having for the last two hours are a luxury, right? You know, we've been, we've been having the BMW of debates, you know, these past two hours, you know, you know, much of what we've said for the past two hours, it'd just be unthinkable, I would say, for most of the world's population still. Okay, sorry, that was another rant, so I'll, I'll bring it to an end. Fascinating. I look forward to the publication. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Eric. And thanks to our audience for their excellent questions and to all speakers for their thoughtful responses. Uh, that's all the time we have for Q&A. So now I'll turn it back to Crystal. Um, I'll invite our speakers to just go down the line now um, in their original speaking order and just have a closing remark, uh, one to two minutes each. Um, and just use this time to address the single most significant point that you all believe our discussion has raised. Um, we'll begin with Catherine. I would be remiss if I did not thank my co-panelists for an incredibly generous and generative discussion. Exactly the, the dream that I was calling for in my own opening remarks, a much more productive and insightful discussion about speech that gets away from the you know, significantly more heat than light that we get in the mainstream press. Um, and also thank you to Nadine for her very generous and expansive thoughts and critiques on my own remarks. It's been a great discussion with you and something of a dream come true considering that I've taught your work. I think that the most important thing that we've all hit on is that you know, even just speaking only about the American context, never mind the vastly more expansive one that Eric rightly admonished us about uh, moments ago, is the intractability of a lot of this, that there are no easy solutions here, and that what we are confronting is not just the power of states, but the power of individuals and people acting informally in groups where we don't have the ability to easily regulate things. And my interpretation of a lot of what particularly Nadine was calling for was a sort of more moral uh, society that we, we would be sort of a priori uh, better speakers and citizen actors, which I, I certainly agree with. How we get there, I don't know. But that's, that is, I think, the, the problem that a lot of us are, are walking away with trying to intervene on. Thank you, Catherine. Um, Jamal? Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, I'll also thank my co-panelists for a very stimulating uh, conversation. Uh, and I guess if I had to say what's the most valuable lesson, uh, it's a lesson that I take away from many conversations about complex um, political and legal subjects, which is the, the importance of humility <laughs> about these questions. These are hard questions. I think when we, when you do look at mainstream discourse around speech, it so often looks like, well, someone at the, you know, the other person is just, is just irretrievably um, lost on these questions. And they just don't, they just don't get it. Don't, don't they get what the framers decided to do? You know, these kinds of sort of conversation enders. And, you know, we all just, I think, could use more humility about what we know, what we don't know. Um, and to that end, I, I'll say something that tends to be sub somewhat subversive in the context of freedom of, of speech, which is that we could use some more experimentation um, here um, that I think different institutions can experiment, can and should experiment. I think maybe safer if it's private institutions, but you know, different institutions can and should experiment with um, with different approaches to, to um, regulation is a loaded word, but um, engagement with um, with uh, uh, with a speech, uh, we value experimentation in the sort of federalism governance context. Uh, I happen to think that there's some value in doing that in the rights context too, given the reality of fundamental deep and reasonable disagreement about 
about rights. And that, that's part of what where my skepticism about our binary frames come, comes from, is that it, it prevents us from uh, trying to think about different ways of doing things and trying to do it with some humility and some openness to uh, rethinking our initial position. Thank you, Jamal. Um, Eric? Yeah, sure. Um, well, the very first article I published on free speech was in, two, um, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago, maybe a bit more in the modern law review. And I was sure after I did that, that I was never going to revisit the issue again, right? And now I don't know how many publications later, it's it's be, almost become now my number one. I was always kind of wanted to do sort of lawn Shakespeare and all the kind of fun stuff. And, um, but I, I guess what's, you know, happened is that, you know, who would have thought even 10, 12 years ago that democracy was in such a peril? You know, you know, between Donald Trump and Brexit and Ukraine and uh, AfD is right, as Catherine mentioned, and God, you know, almost every country now. Um, uh, you know, it used to be a bit of a, you know, a bit of an extravagance to say, well, we have to value democracy and, you know, who knows, it's terribly fragile and all that. But now it really feels this way, at least to me, you know, uh, 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 you know, I don't know whether it was the torture of the Brexit debates or what it was, but, um, uh, or, 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 and certainly, but certainly with the Ukraine war, um, you know, democracy really has started to look like something we can lose. Um, and, you know, one of the things, one of my kind of basics that, you know, that, that I always try to build on is that democracy is nothing but speech. Anything else that you can find, even voting is just a form of speaking. Anything else you can find in a democracy, you can find in a non-democracy. There's only one thing that makes democracy distinctively democratic, and that is speech, nothing else as I've tried to argue at length with greater or lesser success in some of my writing. Um, and that's why, uh, the, you know, as I see democracy, you know, quickly disappearing from everywhere, it's become a more and more important issue and not, not as I thought when I wrote my first piece that, okay, done with this now, can move on back to Lon Shakespeare. I was actually gonna use the word humility as well. Jamal took it out of my mouth. Um, it's really a, a essential for open inquiry, um, candid, frank discussion of the sort that we've been privileged to have here. I want to thank the organizers. It just dawned on me. You could have structured this as a debate. I, I heard somebody refer to the restrictionist perspective, but I, I, I hear people who are struggling with, you know, essentially the same values and how do we accommodate them? Um, Eric, you made two interesting points that are kind of at cross purposes, or what are maybe, uh, but I happen to agree with both of them. Um, one is that we shouldn't focus so much on a Eurocentric, let alone a United States centric uh, perspective, but um, considering how privileged we are compared to assaults, uh, blatant assaults in the rest of the world. But then you talked about democracy really being in peril. And I think e even here and even in the UK, and I think that really is true. Many examples have been given. This program is being hosted by a library and a library department. And who would have thought that we would have seen record numbers of book bannings and attempted book bannings all across this country, um, uh, and with even threats of prosecuting librarians for pornography and obscenity and various other uh, purported crimes. Uh, and, and then let me just say two other words that show that we can never separate ourselves from the rest of the world. In some ways, our free speech uh, is subject to being brought to the lowest common denominator. Uh, one word is, well, it's more, than, it's more than two words. So one example is social media, right? I think what Jamal and the uh, Oversight Board are working on are international worldwide standards. You know, for better or worse, we're gonna be governed by, by the same standards and the same practices. So I really appreciate that they're using international human rights law to inform their decisions. 
Um, the other two words I had in mind were Salman Rushdie. I mean, I just get a chill when I even say that, you know, that we are bringing to the most peaceful, quintessential, all-American place, the Chautauqua Institution in upstate New York, a fatwa that was issued by a regime that could not be more antithetical to ours in terms of freedom of speech and freedom of thought. Um, so um, all of us have a stake in, you know, what goes on in, in Iran and the rest of the world, not only out of some kind of philanthropic uh, abstract uh, concern, but also because it really comes right home to roost here. Thank you, Nadine. Um, and I just wanted to say, I mean, when I was organizing this event and planning with Ed, I, all of, uh, when I was looking for speakers, all of your arguments really stuck out to me. And I was just, I'm grateful for the opportunity to hear you speak kind of in person, <laughs> live, I guess. Um, but before I draw our event to a close, I just wanna ask the audience to do two things. Firstly, you can click, click on the link in the survey that Ed has placed in the chat. Your feedback is important to us. And if you provide your email address, we'll let you know what's coming up next in this event series. Secondly, please join me in giving a warm round of virtual applause to our speakers for sharing your ideas with us today. So thank you all. Um, a video re recording of this event will be posted on the NEIU Library's YouTube channel. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you all very much. Thank you, it's been lovely. I left some notes for Jamal and Eric in particular in chat, but thank you very much. It was wonderful to learn from all of you and listen to you and grateful to share a stage. Absolute pleasure. And I have the benefit that I can now go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Sweet dreams. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank Take you. Care. And thanks again to the organizers. Yes, many thanks. Uh, thank you, Christine. Thank you, Ed. Bye-bye. Good night. Thanks. Good night. <laughs>